Hi, everyone. Uh, before we get this episode started, today is obviously Memorial Day in the United States. Um, we just wanted to say a massive thank you to the men and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Um, we want to honor you guys, and um, we hope you all enjoy the episode. I'm Jack and they hit a lot harder in my opinion, too. What is up, everybody? My name is Caelan McNamara, and everyone's got a plan until they get hit with my views. I am Hunter Boss. He just wanted to go to the distance by the looks of it. But he couldn't even do that. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island Podcast. I am Jack Kennedy, alongside Keelan McNamara and Hunter Boss. The Ultimate Fighter starts in two days. Uh, Tuesday, June 1st, we are recording, obviously, this Sunday afternoon, a very special podcast, all in on the Ultimate Fighter, um, our top 10 moments from the Ultimate Fighter, and five coaches that we would like to see, coaches matchups that we'd like to see in the Ultimate Fighter in the future, or just that we think would be fun to see. Um, a stacked episode, a fun episode, we've been wanting to do this one for a little bit, um, and let's get it started, Hunter, uh, with your top 10 moments, what do you have at number 10? My number 10 is just... All around, I couldn't pick a certain line, but the McGregor versus Uriah Faber smack talk. You know, it, it was such a fun addition to the already fantastic series that, that was going on. And, you know, at moments you're thinking, oh, McGregor's definitely the best trash talker. But then Faber comes back with some good shots, you know, you know, Python slippers. I love it. I love <laughs> it. And then Faber ended up getting McGregor a pair of sandals and flip-flops at the end of it. I'm like, man, this is, this is a great season, you know. Just the dynamic duo of them being together on screen together is just a lot of fun to watch the entire time. Yeah, what an unbelievable season McGregor Faber was. I love it. I still love watching it. For number 10, I actually have an honorable mention. I'm going to slip in first before I give you my actual number 10. And it is actually from that season. And it's a moment that very few people actually remember, which I'm very surprised at. There's a, and I, we men, I mentioned this to the guys in our group chat a few days ago. And I'm going to see if people remember it now. You will remember in one of the early fights um mcgregor dana and uriah faber are all sat at uh, octagon side and the uriah mentions why there's no octagon girls walking around the octagon oh my gosh. and mcgregor says you should go around with the card waving your chin that was <laughs> i love that moment so much and it very it was this close to making it on my list but my actual number 10 is actually from the Ultimate Fighter Team Noguera v Team Mir. And it's Tom Lawler knocking David Kaplan the fuck out with one punch. And, you know, it had to be on this list. It just did. You know, Dave Kaplan was kind of like that guy getting drunk every night, challenging all the guys in the house. And then he ran into Tom Lawler, which was not a good idea. And he's in the bathroom. He actually slaps Tom Lawler saying, you know, not, you know, hit me, hit me. I've got the toughest chin in the house. Tom Lawler lines it up and bang, he goes to sleep. And what still one of my favorite mo moments from tough to this day. And for that reason, it is number 10 on my list. Oh, that is absolutely perfect. I love that so much. I'm starting off my list very strong, and not that I necessarily think this is the, my 10th moment. Like, a lot of these, I feel like, could be interchangeable just because of just how crazy these are. This is just what I have in my number 10. And this is Nate Diaz from Tough Five. Just oh. in general, Nate Diaz from <laughs> Tough Five. With, with the pranks that were going on, almost getting in a fight every night in the house and everything, just Nate Diaz was the all-around, the whole package. Everyone knows Nick Diaz from it. He's like, oh, he has a brother. What's going to happen here? And Nate Diaz made his first appearance and made his long-lasting appearance after that. Just an ultimate season, a legendary season. And Nate Diaz was a large part of why Tough Five was so brilliant. Yeah, now that whole season was fantastic. Gray Maynard, Jay Lo Joe Loison, yeah. Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz was just so funny because, you know, I remember, I, I forgot who wrote it on the wall, but they said Team Pulver sucks. And Nate Diaz got in a, almost got in a fight about that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's not like they're dissing you. They're just dissing the whole team. Like, I don't know. It was a hilarious <laughs> season. It, but it. my number nine is uh, when James Vick landed that super clean knee, all right? So he was losing the fight. He was a super big underdog, and he just comes out there, and out of nowhere, it lands his knee, knocks out his opponent cold, and just it was just such a satisfying moment to see. You know, it was fantastic. Uh, loved to see it every, every time. You know, uh, who doesn't like a good knockout, and especially when you're losing the fight? So uh, that's for the reason I have that's at number nine. 
Dude, that's a great pick. And that was another excellent season. My number nine is another finish, but it's from season 17. And it's that Uriah Hall knockout and Adam Sella. Uh, yeah, I mean, this was this is one of the greatest knockouts I've ever watched, whether it be tough in the octagon, anywhere in combat sports. The execution on this is as clean a finish as you're going to find anywhere, anytime. You know, I remember watching this and I thought to myself, and I still think it was literally like something out of Blood Sport or Into the Dragon. It was that well executed. And what sort of saddens me about such an amazing knockout, and we've talked about this a lot before, is that it almost stunted Uriah Hall's growth because it almost wiped out a lot of his killer instinct, which was such a shame because he'd have done so much more by now if he had continued as much as he had been on that season. Thankfully, Uriah looks like he's getting back to the tough version of Uriah, and I I really do think Uriah could be middleweight champion. He's so naturally talented. And I I really, really hope he does get there one day. But that knockout was stupidly good. And it's number nine on my list. Oh, absolutely. I love that so much. So I'm going to a hilarious moment. And this is one that I personally love so much off of the Conor McGregor Uriah Faber season. Again, some of the most funny moments came off of that season. And this one is one that we talked about a lot and that we all know very well and it is where they're in a hallway both teams team europe and team usa favor Connor, you guys already know where this is going uh the heated battle and, and garbrandt's there within talking and they're they're about to get in an all-out brawl and then strong david tamer steps in and delivers one of the best lines of all time <laughs> you might you want to swallow your water before this one take care of your underwears i'm going to f you man and everybody starts dying laughing around them. And Cody Garbrandt's trying to keep a straight face, trying to lock on to David Tamer as he's saying that because it's supposed to be a serious thing. But Garbrandt's about to lose it. Everybody's losing it around them. All tension dies. One of the best lines ever and just completely killed the mood of the all-out brawl that was about to happen. Just another classic line for the Conor McGregor, Uriah, uh, or Uriah Faber season. It was it was truly amazing. Thank you, David Tamer, for that. <laughs> It's so funny. It's just oh, so man. random too. They're like <laughs> no one was expecting it. It's fantastic. My number eight is actually uh when Ryan Hall first uh submitted uses 50-50 heel hook and just to see everyone's faces after that happened, you know. Everyone's like, oh man, this guy's business. And just the as soon as the guy tapped, I was everyone everyone was just stunned. They're like, oh my god, this is this is insane. We haven't seen Brazilian jiu-jitsu of this caliber in a very long time. Since like Gracie, you know, I, I'm thinking like no one has dominated with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu since Ryan Hall and Royce Gracie. You know, it's just it's insane what happened on that season and Ryan Hall winning the season. And it was a, such a great time. But my number eight is definitely Ryan Hall first landing. It's just to see everyone's reaction is a lot of fun. Yeah, I still remember those reactions now. And the look of shock was just it was like nothing else. So great pick. My number eight comes again from season five, season five with our boy Nate Diaz, and it's the infamous Marlon Sims Noah Thomas brawl. I mean, this one doesn't need much explanation. You know, Sims and Noah got into a massive argument because Sims was obviously talking mad crap about Thomas tapping out in an earlier fight. Thomas does what any level-headed gentleman would do and calls for a fight with him on the spot. And of course, Sims takes up the mantle and they do it. Uh, Alan Berube becomes the referee and the fight spills out to the garden and it's like a WWF no holds barred match amazing fight um unfortunately they both did get kicked off the season for that but it was a it was an amazing memory and to see everybody else's reaction when they actually started getting it official was just the level of organization in itself was impressive yeah. that level of spontaneity is what i respect more than anything but that was a fantastic moment it's still talked about now and it's number eight for me I would say arguably the highest level street fight of all time right there. Yes. Is what happened. Like I, I, I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. My number eight 
tough 14, Michael Bisping, Mayhem Miller, the oh, feud that they had going so on good. and everything, just absolutely hilarious. I, I was watching clips of it earlier, and it's just Bisping trying to get everyone in shape because that was such a weird season because of the lack of respect that people in the house were having for both of the coaches because of what was going on with the coach. And Bisping's trying to get everybody into shape. Mayhem Miller's laughing it off and everything, encouraging the, the bad behavior and everything. Just them, the feud that they had was just amazing. And obviously, when you're going to get Michael Bisping in there and he's going to be trash talking everything and Mayhem Miller just literally living up to his nickname, Mayhem. We all know how, how insane, how crazy he is, how much entertainment he brings. One of the most entertaining seasons and just the chemistry between Michael Bisping and Mayhem Miller was something to watch. Like It was it was amazing. Uh, you could point to any episode and just say that was an amazing moment. Um, just that's that, that's my number eight right there. Yeah, it's a great pick. I love the moment when uh, Bisping um, squirts the water in that guy's face and everyone loses yeah. their shit. It, yeah. it, it was so many great moments from that season, but – my number seven is just anytime Chris Lieben's drunk on the show. He's, seven, you know? he's just hilarious. He says the worst things and he wants to fight constantly. And he just, my memory of Chris Lieben's not even any of his like fantastic fights he has in the UFC. It's just him drunk and crying. You know, it's a fantastic moment on the show. It's a staple in, in, in all of the UFC. Now, Chris Lieben drunk number seven. Oh really my god, the it. fact that he's his own category tells yeah. you everything. <laughs> I, lo- I love that so much. I love it. Uh, and, you know, one of my other moments that I would have put into the list if it was expanded was from the Miller Mayhem season. You may remember the coaches challenge. Bisping gets up on the table and then he slips and falls and then Mayhem just starts <laughs> howling. That I love that so much. And I love Chris Lieben. <laughs> my number seven is actually uh, from Tough 13. And it's Tony Ferguson, where's your kid at? Oh, God. Oh, my and gosh. This, oh is my one of, gosh. this is one of the most low, low-handed, <laughs> savage, unnecessary comebacks I've ever heard in my life. And it's so Tony Ferguson, it had to be on the list. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give a little bit of context in case you somehow haven't seen this. Uh, <laughs> Tony being Tony got ass drunk on in the house and he got mad personal against Charlie Cater because he poured water on him as a joke. And of course, Tony Ferguson, again, being the level-headed gentleman we know him to be, did he take it in his stride? No. He took advantage of Charlie Cater's custody battle and said, where the F's your kid at? Uh, Tony Ferguson doing oh. Tony Ferguson things. Uh, it's so shocking. It's t- It still has to go on the list. I take no pride in putting it on there, but it was just a necessary evil. I mean, you take a little bit of pride putting it yeah, on there, right? I mean, that's, a it's, 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 it's a little yeah. bit. <laughs> a very small, nasty amount of pride, but nothing more. <laughs> Oh my god! He's, he, the, the funny part is he was just so serious, like dead eye when he said, "Yeah, where's your kid? Where's?" It's just so bad. I Expecting him to come out of his suitcase. Where's <laughs> yeah, your kid? Exactly. Oh man. Uh. It's hard to follow that up. I, I don't think I can follow it up for my number seven, but I'll go for another heated moment. And this was when um, the, in the Ronda Rousey versus Misha Tate season where Ronda Rousey was supposed to be facing off against Kat Zinganu in, in that, in that uh, season as well. And at the very beginning, Dana White announced that her bitter rival Misha Tate was actually going to be the other coach. Ooh. And she basically lost it and had like a whole temper tantrum and everything. And that boiled over into the season and made it what it was. Uh, the rock, the rock climbing challenge, and everything—just everything about that season was just pure hatred, equivalent to the Garbrandt versus Dillashaw season as well. Just the just emotional hatred they had for each other and everything, and it boiled into everything as well from the get-go. Literally from when Dana White said Misha Tate was being announced as the other coach, it's it's a real question if Ronda Rousey would have accepted it to begin with if she knew that I was going to be Misha Tate. So when that happened and just the animosity, you actually got to see her reaction of seeing Misha Tate walking into the hallway. A priceless moment on on, on the Ultimate Fighter and one that definitely made for a great season. That's a great shout. I, I forgot about that. And you remind me, I'm like, oh, I kind of wish I put that on my list. But uh, my number six is just the finale fight between Diego Sanchez and Clay Guida. I just oh, the yeah. entire fight. Oh. Fantastic. One of, I already said it. It's one of my favorite lightweight fights of all time. I think I put it, I, I think I put it at number one if I was, if I remember correctly, but there's no way I wasn't going to put this on the list because it was such a fantastic fight back and forth and brawling in the pocket, uh, trading back and forth, hooks, 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 hooks. And, as soon as you think Clay Guida's out, you know, he goes for the takedown, lands it. It's just insane. Submission attempts left and right. It's fantastic fight for a fantastic season. So, number six, Clay Guida versus Diego Sanchez. 
God damn, what a fight. Oh, what um, Was that Tough 9, if I remember correctly? I think it might have been around Season 9, but what a fight that was. And Jack, the only reason Dana did that is because he knows Ronda never would have oh, accepted it. And of it course. was beautiful. Of I course. loved that. Oh, her face just said everything. My number six is a segment that's already been mentioned. It's the McGregor Garbrandt brawl. And the reason I have it as a whole is because there was so much in it, not just that absolute nugget of comedic genius from David Tymore. Um, The first reason I have this on is that McGregor predicted everything about TJ and Team Alpha Male. And that's the part that people tend to overlook, I think. You know, McGregor called it shot for shot. TJ left. You know, he brought Dwayne Ludwig with him. And... Team Alpha Male never got over it. I mean, you look at Cody Garbrandt then saying TJ's my boy. That, I mean, look at what he is now compared to what he was then. So that was mis- that was peak Mystic Mac back then. And then, of course, the second part's already been mentioned, and I'm struggling to hold it together already. Uh, you know, this mass brawl looks like it's about to kick off. Everybody's going to get into it. And then David Tymore being the biggest guy in the show, he comes in. He says, take care of your underwears. I'm going to F you, man. And it, it sounds like something ridiculously homosexual. Everybody busts out laughing. Cody Garbrandt's <laughs> got that semi-confused <laughs> look in his face. He's trying to be I, serious as possible because he's the one and then he's trying yeah. to be serious as the possible. The thing is, really. in, that, in that point, Cody has to be serious because he's calling out McGregor. And then Tymore just comes in and Fs it all up and destroys all the God. tension. And it, it was just an amazing moment. And it is it was never not going to be on my list, put it that way. David Tymore, thank you so much for that contribution to my life. You're in number six. Oh man. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you nailed it. I I I my number my number six is the Conor McGregor snake in the grass comments. Ooh. And this is back before before the brawl took place. Obviously, the, when he said that, and then like it all led to attention that led up to the almost brawl before Damon Tamer spoiled that. Um, <laughs> the, the snake in the grass comments, I would almost go so far as to say, is Conor McGregor's most detailed prediction of what would happen mm-hmm. in the future. Because it actually, what everything he said was so truthful. But then bringing in TJ and everything, you could already you already knew things were already there was tension there, but you could not bring TJ Dillashaw into a worse person to to bring him into in the Ultimate Fighter and Conor McGregor because Conor McGregor will absolutely tear you apart just by speaking the truth and speaking it in his way, and and that's what that's what Conor did. That's what he did. It was it was amazing. The snake in the grass comments. Uh, obviously Garbrandt's there as well. Garbrandt wasn't the name that he is today back then, but he was still a prominent fighter. He was still coming up and people knew who he was. Um, and he was a big member of that gym as well. That's why he was there uh, with, with your right favor. So just saying that the Dwayne Ludwig thing saying, are you going to bring Dwayne with you? And then, and then you rise like, no, TJ's like, yeah, it's like, Oh, it's already building and everything. And just all the snake comments, everything that went right there about the camps, everything is literally what transpired to season 25 and Garbrandt versus Dillashaw, where they're all calling Dillashaw the snake. They're all using that. They're all fighting him. It's incredible how things were already so shaky and things would have crashed anyways. And and, and they would have, they would have still had their beef uh, between Team Alpha Male and, and Dwayne Ludwig and, and TJ Dillashaw. But just Conor McGregor literally, I think, kickstarted it. He, he, he was the one that just pushed pushed him off the edge right there and and after that season literally immediately after the season things just started going crazy because everybody knew it was true everybody knew it was true and connor just exposed it you can't hide from it anymore because you know it's true and it just created all of the chaos it was one of the craziest things i've ever seen unfold and People don't even because re- Connor's not even related to what's going on he's he's not even in this all all this business but he knows it enough and he took TJ coming on to his advantage so much that it was one of the most masterful uses of just words and, and, and trash talk. And it's, I don't even call it trash talk because it was just striking the truth and and and, and saying it in a, a direct manner that just struck to especially your right favorite's heart because he knows I am TJ Dillashaw really isn't my friend anymore. I, I he, he really isn't. He, he he left. He's with he's with Dwayne Ludwig now. And and, the, and TJ's th- thinking the same. They pushed Dwayne out. I'm not Uriah's friend, but we're here because we used to be teammates. It's an awkward situation. Connor said it for what it is and kicked everything off. And it's one of the most unbelievable moments to see play out post tough that it's just you have to look on look you have to look back on it. And I have to rank it so high because it's so crazy to see what unfolded uh, after it. 
Yeah, no, that's Mystic Mac at his finest. You know, you don't really see it too often. Or no, you do see it a lot, no, but that's to. really that really kicked it off. And that I feel like, you know, a lot of people overlook that. So great shout. Uh, my number five is uh, the Dana White speech of do you want to be an ultimate fighter? You know, I feel like a lot of people aren't going to put this on their list, but I feel like it was such a motivating speech. And it, in such a dire time of the show, there was a lot going on. Uh, people were getting angry. And then Dana White comes on the show and he, he, he gives the absolute best speech. And that speech is overlaid throughout everything in the UFC now. You know, do you want to be an ultimate fighter? Do you want to be an ultimate fighter? You know, it's such a trademark in the UFC that if I would be remiss if I did not put this on the list, especially so high as, as it is right now, because it is mentioned over and over and over again. You know, just in commercials, you'll see it anywhere you see. UFC, you'll see, do you want to be an ultimate fighter? And I think it's just such a fantastic just line uh, along with the speech itself. So number five, do you want to be an ultimate fighter? Dude, I love that pick so much. And what people actually forget about that is as well, is that in the finale with Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner, Mike Goldberg said, so you want to be an ultimate fighter? And it just worked amazingly. And like you said, it's in every piece of promotional material that the ufc uses and that they ever will use and they set the tone perfectly from the beginning so amazing pick my number five i don't want to give anything away but this is the key phrase that'll let you see what it is just let me bang bro <laughs> julian lane from yes season 16 yes um the, this was always gonna be there i remember watching this and i just lost my mind laughing because this is one of the greatest things i've ever seen you know, Julian Lane with the red mohawk lost early on in the season. So he had quite a lot of spare time in his hands around the house, antagonizing other people and so on and so forth. Then one night, he basically just had a massive mental breakdown and completely lost his mind. He started smashing his head into walls and punching doors. And he yelled that f- that famous phrase whilst he was crying, just let me bang, bro. And, you know, he had to get restrained and it was a mess. And I think he, I think one of the guys actually put him into his bed and locked the door on him just so he couldn't get back out. He's extremely it- drunk too. Yeah, my, yes, oh, he was. Of course. He was. How he was even still standing is yeah. a question of modern science in its own right. But Julian Lane had to be high up on this list because anytime you have to explain to someone about the UFC, you have to show them that clip because they'll find it for themselves. So you have to be the one to provide context before they find it and think you're crazy. So for that impact alone, Julian Lane has to be at number five. Keelan, we're thinking along the same lines here. I didn't think we were going to cross up, over up. on this. I, this is one of the few <laughs> things I did not think we were going to cross over, but we have just, oh my gosh, you're, 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 you're going through this whole thing and, and you watch it from the beginning. Of course, I rewatch. I rewatch all of these because I had to in preparation for this episode. You're rewatching that. We do it's our just, research. Oh, yeah, of course we do. Our, we have to. I mean, that's a necessary thing. We have to rewatch right there. And you, you, you look at it and it's just so, it's honestly sad at the beginning it's it's very sad because he's actually going through like a mental breakdown and everything and everybody's trying to hold him back you have neil magny in there who's trying to stay out of it until he breaks through four guys and neil magny's there like dude just chill and then he goes into the room and then he says then he's he's in tears getting literally hugged by the guy he's trying to knock out and he's just like just let me bang man just let me bang bro and then the guys then so that part kills me and then the other part that's like i will let you bang man i have let you bang like, <laughs> I, I, that's, that, 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 that thing absolutely kills me and it's just like oh my gosh that is right there the combination of that just the the absolute chaos of the moment and, and everything right there and then just the phrasing of all of that absolutely kills me has to make the top five for me in, in the top 10 uh, uh moments of of the ultimate fighter I, I love it so much and julian lane just thank you for that moment it was amazing <laughs> dang i have to go after that <laughs> <laughs> number four i have uriah hall spinning a uh, wheel kick you know? oh, yeah <laughs> we've not <talking> even mentioned uh, <laughs> <laughs> so can't get over it um he was just able to bang in that fight just, uriah, hall, uriah hall banged his opponent with that spinning wheel kick you know it's just insane absolutely killer clip uh there's not much else to say after that it's probably one the best knockout on the ultimate fighter i would say um uriah hall really proved himself he, he became a contender and as soon as he came out of the ultimate fighter a lot of a lot of the ultimate fighter prospects kind of have to take a little bit of time to start going to the top no, he immediately started getting ranked numbers. It was, it was insane. 
a lot of fighters don't do that except like maybe Matt Serra. But um, it was it was an insane spinning wheel kick to go on to an insane season. So uh, Uriah Hall, and you know <laughs> he had those those weird breathing techniques after the knockout too. He was just this weird ninja stuff. I don't know, but it was it's always fun to see Uriah Hall yeah. in the octagon. Exactly. <laughs> Keelan's got it, yeah. Dude, I love my guy Uriah. And, you know, I really hope no one ever does a no context Ultimate Fighter Instagram channel. I'm oh, giving nobody so ideas because if they take that out of context, it will make us all look really bad. So <laughs> do not do that on us. Um, my number four, Rampage destroys a door. Ooh. This is one of my favorite seasons of all time, Rampage Jackson, Rashad Evans. And the reason I love it is that it's the tale of two coaches. Rashad was actually an amazing coach because, you know, he was a really intelligent fighter anyway. So we knew it would transition into him coaching pretty seamlessly. And he did. But, you know, as much as I love my guy Rampage Jackson, and you know I do, he was just a crap coach from the beginning. <laughs> uh, you know, he picked Kimbo Slice amongst his first fighters, which no disrespect <laughs> to Kimbo. Kimbo's my boy, but you do not pick Kimbo Slice amongst the first fighters if you want to win. Um, you know, Rashad's team had won the first three or four fights pretty easily. And, you know, Rampage tries to play it cool. He tries to make it look like it's not bothering him. He's taking the mech out of Rashad. And then after one of the fights, he just completely loses his mind. And, you know, Rampage literally goes on a rampage. Um, <laughs> he, he actually tries to slam the door and walk out. But the door's that weak. He just put, he puts a front elbow through it. Then he kicks it. Then he brings his other arm through. And he ends up tearing the door off the hinges, slamming it down and walking out. And, you know, credit to Dana White, because he saw the funny side in it. And he said, you know, now people know we have cheap effing doors. <laughs> um, so th this was another iconic moment. And I've literally got written on my notes. I don't know if you can see it here. Do not cross Rampage. <laughs> <laughs> so Rampage Jackson uh, smashing the door number four. <laughs> I mean, I can't disagree with that at all. Uh, yeah. Hunter, we're on the same page now. I was, I was with Boom. Keelan the last time. Now, Hunter, we're on the same page. Uh, Uriah Hall knockout, that spinning wheel kick, landing, knocking the, the, his opponent out cold. I think you would have to argue very, very, very hard to say that anyone's even in competition with that for tough, for the greatest knockout and, and, and all the ultimate fighters history. Because I think that is just hands down, far and away. Uriah Hall, that knockout was just unbelievable to watch. Like Keelan said, one of the best knockouts in UFC history, not just Ultimate Fighter history. You can rewatch it over and over again. It's used on all of his highlights, even still. Not many fighters are, have their Ultimate Fighter highlights on their on their highlight reel when they get into the UFC. Uriah Hall, that's always the first one that plays for a good reason. Um, I honestly think that that knockout did so did wonders for his career and was able to get him those ranked opponents. But I also think him personally, he is one of those guys that has all the talent in the world but mentally kind of struggles because he's such a nice guy. He, he was doing a lot of those breathing techniques, but I remember him talking about it. It was because he felt so bad for celebrating whenever he hurt the guy so bad um, in, in doing that. He was actually worried for the guy. He was, he was worried about him because of just how brutal the knockout was and everything. And I think that messes messed with him a little bit. I mean, he got that win. He lost the, the, the finale and then got that win over uh, Chris Lieben in, in, in like 30 seconds, which was amazing. Um, and then started to claim, climb the ranks, went off and on. And then now he's looking like a real contender. Um, up until up until that point, I'd say that Gegar Mousasi, Gegar Mousasi knockout was like his highlight of his career up mm -hmm. to that point. Um, but but now he's really starting to look like he's mentally ready to go and everything. But despite all of that and despite everything, and, and a, lot of that, a lot of that's just being Uriah Hall's a nice person. But I'm just saying, uh, despite all of that, that knockout will live in history as the greatest on, on the Ultimate Fighter's history until someone does like a cartwheel kick knockout or something even crazier. Cause yeah. that was the other two, the Edson Barbosa spinning wheel kick knockout. That is the second best kick knockout in my opinion, in UFC history. Um, it was amazing. And just uh, Uriah Hall. That was, that was incredible. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. It's on my list. Um, my number three is actually what Keelan had for number four, I believe, which is the rampage breaks the door down. But I'm also going to kind of split it with a uh, rampage, the stare down he has with Rashad Evans. Uh, I think that's yeah. one of the most intense stare downs I've ever seen. And, you know, rampage just talking during it. He's like, come on, throw, throw a punch, throw a punch. You want And Rashad's like, Oh, you'll, you'll feel it when I throw a punch. And, you know, it's just insane back and forth talk. It's just great. It is a fantastic stare down. So intense and rampage 
Then breaking the door, of course, always, always fun to see. You, you always see clips of that somewhere, even if it's not UFC related. You know, if it's just a meme, you'll see Rampage just breaking down a door randomly. It just, it's, it's an iconic moment in UFC and in just sports history. So it's hard not to put that on the list. I mean, I can't add any more to that. <laughs> you know, he's staring down Rashad in the hallway. Tell me you didn't just do that. He says yeah. that about four times over and over again. Rashad's wearing the gold aviators. It's perfect. It just works. I don't know why it works, but it works. My number three, and I will bet any amount of money this is in your guys' top three as well, the Chael Sonnen Anderson Silva or Vanderlei Silva brawl. There it is. I mean, I, I'm going to take my time with this one just because I enjoy reliving it so much. Uh, Tough Brazil 3, Chiel goes into enemy territory after talking mad smack about Brazil. Like, if anybody somehow so has bad, seen dude. this, <laughs> you do not understand. <laughs> this was a verbal napalming of Brazil by Chiel Sonnen, and he was piloting the B-17. <laughs> like, this was... He torched them for about two years straight. Oh. So, being Chiel Sonnen, what does he do? He agrees to go to the heart of the country that he's just torched repeatedly, <laughs> and he decides to go up against the champion of the people, Vanderlei, the axe murderer, Silva. <laughs> and, you know, this was a great season in its own right. We got guys like Paulo Costa out of it. You know, really, really good fighters. But this is the moment that stands out to everybody, and for good reason. You know, Chael's doing Chael things. The man from Westland, Oregon. He's standing there. He's in his jeans. He's in his sandals. He's doing his thing. Vanderlei Silva then goes over to him, starting to antagonize him, saying that he wants to fight. Chael says, oh, I wish we could, and we will, but just wait, because we're trying to do this properly. You're making me look like the good guy. Like, if you've <laughs> ever, if, if you've never seen it, I'm actually going to give a real quick shout out. Watch episode 822 of the Joe Rogan podcast with Chael Sonnen, because he explains it, and it's incredible. Do watch it, but back to the story. You know, Silva's looking for a fight. He keeps pushing Chael, intimidating Chael. Chael's not scared because Chael just isn't. And then Chael pushes him saying, I can't let you get close. <laughs> you know, Vanderlei goes for the overhand right. He misses. Chael lands the most beautiful double leg takedown in jeans and flip-flops I've ever seen in my life. He gets to mount position. One of Vanderlei's fighters come out, comes over and actually starts punching Chael in the head. Yeah. <laughs> and then the guys get separated. He got kicked off for that, which was good. I'm glad they did that but it was such a beautiful moment from chill and it, you know chill was just untouchable at that time and it was so so good and we still talk about it even now chill son and the american gangster is number three yeah wow and people thought colby covington's comment comment which was terrible about brazil was, was not bad. good you, you don't remember <laughs> they didn't remember chill son and his whole tirade on on brazil for colby's a, a peasant's chill <laughs> get out of here yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, like Kobe wasn't like, first to do it. Chael did it, and McGregor did it. Everyone forgets McGregor, McGregor did. It. But McGregor definitely hammered them as well. Oh man, he was saying he was the king whenever he was sitting oh, there, and yeah, over and then he'd ride into the favelas. Yeah, yeah. that <laughs> that was uh, that was that was that was something. That whole uh, I apologize to our Brazilian viewers, by the way. Yeah, I'm, it was I'm not him. Yeah, this isn't yeah. us. This is us reliving yeah. the moment. This is right? this is just objectively looking at what <laughs> happened. <laughs> it's not commenting on it. We're just we're just saying we're just saying what happened. But yeah, all right. So my number three, uh, I'm going back with Hunter Rampage Door. Um, I have a feeling Ooh. we're gonna line up pretty much even on this might, three, two, one might. right here. Um, but yeah, Rampage Door. I'm not even gonna say that much about it because you guys absolutely nailed it. I mean, just the just the absolute method he just completely murdered the door is what I love so much about it. I mean, the, the stuff leading up to it's what makes it and everything, but just the way he just completely just takes everything out on the door and everybody's like not within 10 feet of them because they're like, what is going to happen? I just love it so much. And it literally fits rampage nicknames so much because it's just like, that is what you would expect. That's why people are watching the ultimate fighter just to see things like that coming off of this dare now coming off of everything. Just, just destroy a door. Why not? Daniel White's response after it is literally perfect, literally golden. Uh, and, and, and everything following it. I just love that moment so much. And, uh, Obviously, it's been meme too. You you see it for everything because how could that not be used for everything? Literally any situation that can be used for. Uh, I love it so much. Yeah, and that's my number three. Yeah, no, great pick. Uh, I have Keelan's uh, number three as my number two. Uh, Chael Sonnen's double leg takedown. It's probably 
it's so close to being my favorite moment. I almost, I almost had, I had it up there for so long. I'm like, okay, I got to switch this out real quick. But um, it's such a great moment because Chael's just standing there. He's got his arms folded and, and he just sees, he's like, he like looks the biggest to his left. arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he looks to his left and Vandalay's just already staring at him and he's just talking smack. And Chael's like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> we haven't even done anything yet. Like, I haven't done anything to you, right? Like, at this moment. And Vandalay's, you know, clapping in his face trying to make him do something and Chael's not biting on any of this and then finally Vandalay gets close of course yeah I can't let you get close to me I can't get I can't let you get close to me it's just uh, yes, iconic yes. you know it doesn't get much better than that and and of course not only did did um uh, Vandalay miss his overhand right Chael made him miss you know he, he ducked under that was on him you know that's all that's he made him miss miss he ducked under had that perfect level change Went for that double leg and started beating up Vandalay, kind of like a. It was like it was like a foreshadow for when they fought in Bellator next. You know, it's exactly what happened. You know, the entire time. So, it's hard to complain, but of course, I could not mention this list, list without the. <laughs> you can't get close to me because Chael Sonnen is the bad guy, but of course he's got some he's got some great one liners. So Chael Sonnen number two. Oh, absolutely. Oh man, and just the level change. It was just oh, <laughs> bellissimo. Just Chris, um, you, you, know, you see my, the level changes in the UFC. Wrestling at its and finest. Then you see that one, you're like, oh <laughs> that was a level change fighters could die for in the octagon. Yeah. That was you want that to be your level change, okay? Danny um, Cormier needs to break it down on his the, the point or the detail. Yes, he thing. Detail. absolutely does. <laughs> yeah. Elite boxing defense, moving straight into the level change of the double leg, just seamless. My number two is actually Hunter's number four, number five, and it's that speech from Dana White. And the only reason it's this high up is because of how important it is. And we've mentioned this already. You know, if anybody hasn't seen the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, it was, you know, it was understandable, but it was a little bit of a mess in some ways. You know, a lot of the fighters were quite unprofessional and they started kicking off because they realized they weren't getting paid for fighting in the octagon. And then basically Dana hears about this. He marches down from headquarters and he administers a verbal flamethrower to these fighters, which quite frankly, they needed. And he absolutely torches them for about five minutes straight. Um, I won't get into the finer details of what he said, but of course, his outline do you want to be an effing fighter or not? Do you want to go back to your ordinary jobs or do you want to change your life? And it's it's not just that. It's that it's one of the most iconic moments of all time in combat sports, I think, because this is this is where the trend is set and this is where the standard is set for anybody who's ever going to come, in, come into the UFC and anybody who ever comes into tough. Do you want to be an effing fighter? It was beautifully timed. It was perfect being in the first season. And like we said, it's been used in every um, piece of promotional footage that's ever been used and ever will be. So Dana deserves a lot of credit for that because it was perfect in so many ways. And you can tell it wasn't scripted and it was all coming from the heart too, which is important. So Dana's spontaneity was huge. Yeah, Iconic is right for that situation. It totally set the pace for not only that season's finale, which I'm sure we'll all have on our list um, coming soon, but also for just the entire UFC as a whole. Obviously that and then then Goldie's comment as well. They they go hand in hand. They're used for everything. Absolutely Iconic. My number two, uh, Chael versus Vanderlei Silva. Obviously, I mean, just the the ultimate situation. You guys already said enough about it. You guys already nailed it. To, to the point where no one else could nail it even further. But I will say this, you missed the best point. This is why it's one of the best level changes, takedowns of all time. Kale Sonnen kept his flip-flops on the entire time. Oh, he course. was able to take him down, <laughs> keep his flip-flops on, stand up. Everything was fine. He was still in jeans and flip-flops, everything. I don't think any other human being could do that on the planet and, and, and maintain his look after going at that with Vanderlei Silva. <laughs> Just an absolutely legendary moment. Another iconic moment. I won't even add to it too much because you've already heard so much about it, but that's just the last point I was thinking. You guys missed out on that so much. The flip-flops is the big story lamp. It's the big storyline of that whole situation. I mean, Chael son and absolutely nailed it yeah the gangster the original gangster or what it's they don't uh, call you the bad guy for nothing yeah (laughs) yeah he's he's great he's great 
Number one, surprise, surprise, Forrest Griffin versus Stefan Bonner. How can you not include this? It literally saved the UFC. Um, it was all just, just a fantastic fight back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And leading up to this, there's so much, you know, it, they were on, it was the first time the ultimate fighters ever been aired. Um, there's fighters were pissed, you know, they're living in the house for months and it's time to let it all go because they're fighting for the contract finally. And they just leave everything in the octagon and the chance that it could have gone to a fourth round because of their crazy rules back then was insane. I, I was, I was, everyone was hoping it would, you know. I, I, don't, I don't think I was alive for when it happened. Actually, I was alive, but I was very young. But when I watched the fight and I'm like, oh, man, and I heard the commentator saying, oh, this might go to a fourth round for the split decision rules. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, the, how, how awesome would it be if we got the fourth round for that? But both fighters were completely exhausted by the third round, so it's probably for the better it didn't go to the fourth round. But this literally saved the UFC. You know, They needed a, to be bought out a little bit because they needed the money really badly. This was the last opportunity for them to even get a call. And people were dialing up on the phones. Go check out this fight right now. It's absolutely insane. Watch it right now. It's, it's crazy. And, of course, Forrest Griffin delivers and ends up getting the W. But that's no discredit to Stefan Bonner because it takes two to make a fantastic fight. So, number one, Stefan Bonner versus Forrest Griffin. Yeah, there was never going to be any other number one. It had to be this and this alone. I'm obviously talking about uh, Cody Garban and TJ Dillashaw. Uh, I'm joking. Yes. I'm joking. Yes. I'm joking. It isn't. No, Hunter just said it absolutely perfectly. This, I mean, we use the word literally a lot now, and its meanings become diluted a lot. But this is the fight that literally saved a company from going into non existence. You know, the UFC were in pretty, they were actually in very dire straits going into this. fight and the job of hiding it from people but they were in a bad way i mean you look at any of dana's interviews he's very candid and honest about it but what an unbelievable fight and as hunter said the possibility of this going to a fourth round with split decision rules was mind-boggling back then probably something steve mazagati would have done oh, but yeah, that's yeah. that's neither here nor there um one of the great things about this and one of the real feel-good stories about this is that Apparently, Spike TV executives who obviously had the contract to or the UFC back then, they weren't actually interested in renewing the contract. They just wanted to ride out the finale, and then that would have been that. And Dana White tells the story of literally minutes after the fight, him and the Spike TV executives were outside in the garage, and they hashed out the deal for the new contract there and then. And... It, the fight's just so important. Not only is, one of, is it one of the greatest mixed martial arts contests ever, but I actually have the figure that Hunter was alluding to. It drew 3.3 million wow. viewers on Spike in 2005. We, we lose our minds now if we get 3.3 million viewers for anything and we have the internet and we have like cable TV over there and everything. They drew this on a free channel in 2005. Over 3 million viewers. Do you have any idea how crazy that is? It's and it's nothing but a credit to the UFC and to the two guys who did it. If it were any other fighters, we probably wouldn't have a UFC to talk about right now as we're recording this. So unbelievable moment this is kind of the scenario that eminem wrote lose yourself for this is it this is the scenario that matches the song and it was always going to be number one um force griffin stefan bonner take a buy and take many buys until the end of time yeah absolutely i mean uh, same page as you guys it has to be number one it you, you, you nailed it perfectly the, the use of literally it, it actually saved the ufc and it wasn't only that it saved the UFC. It was the Dana White had and, and people in the UFC had basically no hope about the situation. It wasn't like they were hoping for this fight to be amazing. And they're like, Oh, if this fight delivers, we'll get picked up again. That wasn't really there. It was, they were expecting just the contract to run out. Everything was going to happen. This literally came out of nowhere. And, and because the fight was what it was, which was one of the best fights of all time, it saved them and, and they got the new contract signed out there. Not even obviously Spike wasn't expecting it. Spike was ready to right there to, after the fight to sign the this is it. We're, we're not even sign it, but just to like show him a contract to say, hey, this, this is done. We're running up. We're not going to resign you. And then it, it happened and everybody shocked. And then it, it, it carried the UFC to what it is today. Not only is this important for 
the UFC, but I think this fight was necessary for MMA as a whole. Because of what we've seen the UFC done, I'm not exactly sure if another organization would have been able to rise to the level of what the UFC has become and stardom and everything. Obviously, Pride was huge and everything, but Pride wasn't still, because it was it was in Japan, it still wasn't the biggest mainstream thing in, in the States, which in the States, it spreads everywhere and it gets insane. So who knows where MMA goes from here if uh, th- this fight doesn't happen? And especially the company of the UFC as a whole, what, what we know of it today and what it, the UFC has done for MMA as a whole lies in this fight right here between Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin. The fight itself, one of the best fights of all time. I watch it all the time, honestly. I, it, it's, it's a great YouTube watch. Obviously, it's everywhere in the UFC. It's uh, Instagram, or Instagram's uh, posts and, and YouTube. Um, go watch it if you haven't watched it before. It's not only is it just an incredible fight, but you just get the feeling of everybody watching it at the time of the circumstances of everything at the time as well. Just the fight is one of those historic moments that will live and not only the UFC's history forever, but just sports history in general. It is just that iconic of a moment um, and everything leading into it. I, you guys mentioned the speech, the ultimate fighter speech before. I think I tie this into that so much because of everything that Dana White said in that moment right there. And these guys embodied the words that he said right there, went out there, Blood, sweat, tears, left it all on the line. Obviously, Stefan Bonner was devastated at the end of it. Forrest Griffin won. Really, you could give it to either one of them. It, it, it honestly, yeah. the fourth round was definitely on the table. But Forrest Griffin getting the win, getting the contract, of course you're going to give Stephen Boffer, Stephen Bonner a contract off of that as well, which a great move by the UFC. Not even like it was a thing that they were going to talk about. Of course he's going to get a contract off of that. So Forrest Griffin gets the whole celebration. Stephen Bonner still gets to celebrate because he made the UFC – an ultimate win-win-win situation for the UFC, Forrest Griffin, Stefan Bonner, the fans, everybody. One of the best moments in the company's entire history. Yeah. And Keelan alluded to the lose yourself reference. I'm going to do him one better. I'm going to go till I collapse. I think that's a better Eminem song to really uh, capture the moment till mm-hmm. I collapse. Give it a listen and then watch it while you're listening. And fantastic fight, fantastic songs. Go ahead and watch it. Combine them, yeah. Listen to both while you're watching it. But, um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious, Hunter. I actually love that. That's a fantastic shout with Nate Dogg, especially my oh, guy. Of course, of course. Um, you know, the thing is, we again, there's a lot of things that are taken for granted now, and a lot of things that are taken out of context. This is one of the moments that changed the history of sports forever. MMA could have died out as a sport as we know it. The UFC really was carrying the flag back in the day. This is sort of the equivalent of like in the Monday Night Wars and pro wrestling when mankind beats the rock for the title and the WWE goes on to become what it does. This is the Sergio Aguero 93-20 moment in the Premier League. It's that moment that changes the course of history, and you know it does. It's so, so important. And Jack, you're absolutely right to bring up the bigger picture of mixed martial arts as a whole, because mixed martial arts could have died out that night and then would have been relegated to being, you know, in fought in garages or local cards. This signified the end of the UFC's instability and the growth of mixed martial arts as a mainstream sport. It just rocketed after that. And the UFC was never really in any danger again, thanks to the performance those two guys put on. So this is this is one of those diamond pinnacle moments in sports history that is up there with the best and the most important. If you somehow have never seen this fight, the first thing you should do after this is go and watch that. It is, it's one of the greatest displays of guts and heart and courage you'll ever watch in any combat sport. And it's just such a huge moment. Watch it with those songs. Watch it after with those songs. Do whatever you want to do, but make sure you watch it. And it's, it's just the ultimate number one moment. It just is. Could not have said it any better. I mean, first you have to listen to it with the commentary because you have to hear everything that's going on right there too. But then listen to it with the songs, combine whatever, everything about it is absolutely legendary. All right, now for the moment, I have been so excited to hear (laughs) your guys' opinions on this next segment right here. What We're going to go our top five, top five-ish, five that we want to see coach combinations for the Ultimate Fire seasons to come or or just coaches that we would think the Ultimate Fire would be entertaining with. Uh, Hunter, get us started. What's your number five? All right, my number five, I don't think anyone else will have, is Devison Figueredo versus Henry Cejudo. Coaching matchup. 
bring back the king of the cringe because fighters that are on that show will not want Henry Cejudo as their coach, but then they'll realize halfway through, dang, he actually knows what he's talking about. Dang, he's got some fantastic wrestling. Man, his striking's not half bad. You know, it's going to be a, it would be a fantastic season for both for the, for the reasons of not wanting to be on Henry Cejudo's team and realizing halfway through, man, I should have been on Henry Cejudo's team. It's just, I feel like the dynamic duo of having Debson Figueredo there, not be able to speak much English, so it'll have to be translator to, to English, which would yeah. be a lot of fun. And uh, just Henry Cejudo's trash talk that he always has, which is in person when they're both staring each other down, a lot of fun to have. Devinson Figueredo versus Henry Cejudo is my number five. Oh my God, Triple C. He's calling himself C4 now. Well, he the man's not he an hasn't earned the fourth one yet. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> whatever. It's a very good shout, though. His breakdown videos are fantastic mm-hmm. in terms of the transitions and everything. So he does deserve credit, but he can be irritating too. But a very good shout. I like that. My number five is sort of a bit of a throwback to what I would have liked to see. So I don't know if this cheating or bending the rules or whatever, but it would have been funny. So I'm keeping it. Yeah, keep it. Um, this is. My number five is Chael Sonnen and Tito Ortiz, and oh I've literally, I have literally, <laughs> oh, no. I've literally oh, written, no. I have literally, I've literally written ba ha 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 next to this <laughs> because this would be, I would watch every single episode of this three times, you know. In Bellator, it was just verbal abuse, press conference after press conference, from Tito's attire to his car being repossessed, to his family, to his wife. (laughs) His car got repossessed. It's it's the most savage verbal beatdown you'll ever see, and it almost gets to a point where you're sad for Tito. And seeing this... Seeing this across the season would be the single most joyous event of my life to watch. And I'm not even justifying it any further. That's my number five. Ealing, you're a madman. Uh, this is not good. This, this, this is the, 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 the laugh right there. That's an evil laugh. This would just, this is be what the people want to say. Verbal <laughs> abuse. This would, <laughs> uh, who knows That's what messy. would happen? Oh, <laughs> Tito oh, Ortiz God. wouldn't be able to make it. Oh, no. Oh, he'd quit halfway God. through and then he'd go join the California. <laughs> Long Beach. Uh, no, he would bring his Saturday. city council meeting yeah, to the Ultimate Fighter right there. Oh. He'd hold the meetings while he's coaching his oh, fighters. Yeah. I guarantee Tito would sue Chael after that for just some sort of like <laughs> ridiculous lawsuit because of Anything. something he said. Like that, that would guarantee it to happen. I uh, uh, there's uh, this. It's not even worth talking about. I don't even know what's gonna happen. All right, whatever. <laughs> you could do that right now; it'd still be entertaining. But. All right, my number five, another random one that I don't think either of you guys will have, but I would love to see, is Yuri Prohoshka versus Jan Blakovic on The Ultimate Fighter. And this is from the personality and getting to know Yuri Prohoshka, um, it's a mysterious guy in the UFC, obviously, um, a very spiritual guy. And, and the, a lot of the stuff he does is so weird and everything. That would make some for some really funny moments. And obviously, we know Jan Blakovic, and he has a very fun personality and, and getting to know him more. And I think Yuri and Jan going back and forth, not necessarily – feuding with each other but just the competitive nature and just i think it would be a hilarious season and we would see some great moments and some great fires coaching as well um and some interesting teams and everything i think it would make for a great season not quite as great as tito versus chael um but uh it, I, I still think it would live up to the hype <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one because my number four is actually jan blahovich versus yuri Brahaska oh no well. way okay but it's also tied with another one so i'll go in more in depth right. with my other one all right so this is more of my fake one, like my, my four fun one. Yeah. Let's do an ultimate fighter of Dana White, Tito Ortiz, but their boxing match that they were supposed to have. <laughs> oh, yes. No, they yes. both they all got coaches. The or they, they're they're both coaches. They, <laughs> exactly. The one Tito <laughs> didn't show up for. It was good. And they all have uh they all have students that are supposed to train here, but no one's focusing on them because everyone's <laughs> focusing on the feud between Dana and Tito. <laughs> and uh, of course the coaches' challenges would be beautiful, you know, just be like Oh my god! <laughs> I don't even know what oh they could be, god. but Dana White versus Tito Ortiz was tied for number four with Yuri Prohaska versus Jan Blahovich because they both have such fun personalities. Like Yuri's just strange. He's kind of like Keelan has mentioned before. He's kind of like the Tony Ferguson of the light heavyweight division, and Jan Blahovich is just a the, the, the lovable big giant. You know, he's he's out there. He he's got, he's got so much so many weird stories, and he shares so many weird things with everyone and. He's always having I mean, a laugh. He was having a he was having a laugh with uh, Israel Adesanya after their fight. You know, 
and he's hugging him. And, you know, I'll be your bodyguard, even that's not even what <laughs> Izzy said. It's just always fun to see Jan Blachowicz on screen and to do it with another person uh, from like around his home country, you know, it'd be perfect. So uh, my number four, two, which is kind of cheating, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah, I love those shots. Those are all amazing. My number four is actually tied as well. One of them's a fantasy, and one of them's one that I think will actually happen. The one I think will happen is Jorge Masvidal, Colby Covington. The 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 Miami beef, and that would just be epic. I would just love to see that so much because just the but the trash talk and the adrenaline and all that that would just be amazing and the fantasy one that I'd actually love to see is Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz oh, oh that, would, I, that could happen that doesn't have to be a fantasy one they, they that could have happen. coming up Oh, that would be, see those press conferences, absolute genius. And with the greatest of respect to Nate, you know, he's not the most articulate <laughs> fighter there's yeah. ever been, but some of his responses were legendary in their own right. I mean, if you remember when Conor McGregor had his movement coach, Edo Portal, and Nate was talking about playing touch pot That's for that in dwarf park. in the park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just to watch those coaching sessions would be amazing. Nate just pulling guard on everybody and going to the ground and McGregor just talking about a bunch of madness. So I actually think Hunter's right. That might not be as much of a fantasy as I think it is. If it were to happen, I'd love to watch it because they're two very high level guys and to see what they would bring to their fighters would be amazing. So that's my number four pick. It's joined between Covington Masvidal and McGregor Diaz. I like it a lot. Yeah. I, okay. So I have to make a joint one now too, right? I have to follow suit. So we'll go. We'll go off the off the top of my head. We'll go Dana White versus the illegal streamers as my first. <laughs> <laughs> as my first joint. <laughs> you have the whole SWAT team outside, ready to go on standby for after the fight. We're good to go. <laughs> they just storm uh, little Billy's room. And just wanted to see the fight. <laughs> Uh, the streamers get a, a legal streamer Khabib Nurmagomedov with them though, and he, he gets to <laughs> of course. he gets to he gets to show the Kevin Holland fight with them. But yeah, um, but my serious pick is, uh, and I think this one could actually happen realistically. I killed Keelan. We'll see when he comes back. I'm thinking <laughs> I'm thinking Conor McGregor versus Justin Gaethje would be a good one uh, to that'd be, see. That'd be awesome. Um, I, I think I think the trash talk that's been building up between <sighs> them would would be very entertaining to see. <sighs> um, and something that I personally would want to see too. And I think it would make <laughs> make for a great matchup in the future as well. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing it. I just think I think Connor. I think Connor Gaethje, and, and we already we've already seen a Conor McGregor uh, 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 Ultimate Fighter season. What he did with Uriah Faber, Justin Gaethje would definitely bring the heat. And you have Trevor Whitman there as well, and all of his <sighs> uh, elite uh, gym with him as well. I think it would make for a great season and just an overall great fight following that. Um, so yeah, Conor McGregor, Justin Gaethje, and obviously Dana White versus the illegal streamers is is my is my secondary pick right there. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, anything with Dana White will make me crack up. So <laughs> my number three is uh, is John Jones and Ganu. How can I not have oh, it there? Oh, I like it. The fight's like been it. brewing for about a year now. Everyone's been having talks, and you know now this fight with Derek Lewis is going to be happening with Ganu here soon. So John Jones is yet again put on the back burner, but you know what? This could be put on the back burner for a new UFC Dolchman fighter. So who knows? It could be great. We can have another heavyweight uh, special, which I love watching the heavyweights go at it. Um, I think John Jones, he's been on the Ultimate fighter, I think only once so far. And he wasn't not entertaining. He was a, he was a fun, fun coach to watch. He had, he had valuable input and he is one of the greatest UFC, UFC fighters to ever do it. You know, he's, he's nearly the GOAT. And to even have him as a coach, anyone would be lucky. But to have Francis Ngannou behind them too, and any of his coaches and his ties with everyone would be amazing uh, uh, resources as well. So I have John Jones versus Francis Ngannou at number three, mainly just because I just want to see him fight. So That's an amazing pick. And imagine upsetting Francis Ngannou as your coach. Oh, oh I am going to be in the next county if that happens. Yeah. Dana White against millions of streamers. What have we become? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man, I'd pay to see that. It's like a gauntlet match, and then Khabib gets thrown in with one of them. My number three is another fun match, and it's Darren Till and Robert Whitaker. I love it. Yes. Or, yeah. or Darren Till against Mike Perry. 
Mike Perry. That's and a good one. Mike Perry, <laughs> I just had to do it. Um, the Robert Whitaker one, I actually think makes a lot of sense because Robert Whitaker is an incredibly intelligent fighter and he was a great coach before against Calvin Gastelum too. Um, Darren Till and Mike Perry would just be fireworks every episode. It'd be Darren Till asking Mike if he wants to spa. And then <laughs> Mike Perry saying, oh, I thought you meant spar. Uh, and then... Did you see their most recent um, Instagram live? Uh, oh my yeah, god! Sure. <laughs> like and they were talking about who'd beat the other, and then Mike said, "Oh, I'll take you down to the ground and I'll beat your ass." And then Mike Perry said, "No, nah, man, your jujitsu's dog shit." <laughs> and it just uh, like just imagine a whole season of those two camped up next to each other. The Darren Till Whitaker one is one I think could happen. And also after every episode, you just get Rob question mark everywhere, yeah. which I'd hate to see in its own right. But Till and Perry would just be comedic gold. So that's my number three. Yeah, I, I love that so much. Um, my number three is uh, actually one that I hope doesn't happen. And this is weird. I'll explain myself, okay. but um, maybe down the line, but, but one that I would be so entertained to see. The reason I don't want to see it is because of the circumstances and what's going on, but Pyotr Jan versus Aljamain Sterling. So the reason I don't want this one to happen is because I don't want it to stall the division any longer than it has to. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's a ridiculous point. It, it's ridiculous at this point. But just imagine the trash talk and everything that would be going into it. All of the It would be so heated. The, the way they, they trash talk and the way they talk to each other is almost a little bit lighthearted, but it would be a very heated uh, season and every episode would be so intense between them because of what happened in their championship match. And I would just love to see how they coach their respective fighters, but also balance the relationship between each other, keeping it respectful despite all of the unfortunate circumstances that happen within the fight. I think it would make some for some very interesting moments. And I think just both those personalities mixing would just be fireworks and would make it for a very exciting season. I could just see the prank wars happening, you know. Yeah. Peter Yang's yeah. team gives Aljamain Sterling a bunch of Oscars. You know, it'd just it'd be amazing. Oh totally. Uh my number two here is is interesting, but I would love to see a Valentina Shevchenko versus Amanda Nunes ultimate Ooh, fighter season. I like it. You know, I they're like both it. on the top of both their weight divisions. They fought previously. It was both very close fights. You know, it wasn't like super dominant like they're used to for both fighters. And they're close fights, which I love to see. And both fighters can bring such valuable input for their teams. It would, it's unbelievable. They're the best woman fighters of all time. Valentina Shevchenko has some of the best, best ground games she could teach. Amanda Nunes has some of the best stand-up she can teach. And it's not like they both have bad stand-up or bad ground game either. So there'd be so many different variables would go into this. Um, and just an all-out all out fantastic final fight, of course. So I have to go with Valentina Shevchenko, Amanda Nunes. Man, I love that. That's, yeah. that's such a good shot. They were actually on my list, and I took them off, and I probably should have kept it on. But that's, a, that's an unbelievable shot. My number two, and I'm almost semi-serious when I say this because I would like to see it happen, and it's Derek Lewis against anybody. <laughs> Literally give any other heavyweight that you want. I want to see Derek Lewis on the Ultimate Fighter. And there's quite a lot of reasons for this. Derek Lewis is obviously one of the funniest human beings in existence today. And, um, you know, he, he's within striking distance of the heavyweight gold for 8 million, which he said he will do. And the funny thing is on a serious note, I actually think Derek Lewis would be a real inspiration to the guys that he coaches. Not only will they love him because he's so funny and most of them probably follow him already, but you know, his social media posts would be amazing. Okay. And he, he's a very relatable guy. You know, he came up yeah. from nothing. And a lot of those guys, some of them may be in similar circumstances themselves. And to have a coach who can nurture you in that way, if he's serious enough, would actually be a very valuable asset. And plus, it's been quite a while since we've had a heavyweight tough. The last one was Miocic and Cormier. And to have someone fun and lovable like Derek Lewis, the views that would get would just be off the charts. And plus, you know, who doesn't like Derek Lewis? I don't think even Derek Lewis's opponents hate Derek Lewis. So you can't tell me there's someone who hates Derek Lewis. And that is my number two, Derek Lewis. And the reason I said anybody is that no particular heavyweight comes to mind. And Ghanu would actually be pretty funny, yeah, you know, because like they're that. both they're both nice, relatable guys. John Jones would be funny as all oh, hell. Awesome. 
But yeah, no, Derek Lewis is definitely my number two. Dang it, Keelan. We're on the same page right here. I, I absolutely love it. Derek Lewis has to be. I mean, we, we were talking about this on the last podcast or after or whatever. I don't, I don't even remember, but we've been talking about this one for a little bit. Derek Lewis and the, being in the Ultimate Fighter would be the most entertaining thing since I think maybe Rampage being in the Ultimate Fighter with against against Rashad Evans. I think he would just line it up, be hilarious, his personality, uh, just everything about it. People would obviously want to go to his side because he of, of the relatability because he is an elite athlete, but everything just because he would he's a generally funny guy and he would make some for some great moments between fighters and everything. I'll make it specific though. I'm a, I would love to see a John Jones versus Derek Lewis mm-hmm. ultimate fighter season. I think John Jones would bring the personality to it and it would also bring some heated mm-hmm. moments too because the fighters being picked would almost be torn between who would they want, you know. John Jones, you're getting probably the more technical not probably you'd be getting more technical advice and, and the and the honestly better advice but in Derek Lewis you get arguably maybe the better fighter coach out of it so it's an interesting dynamic right there and obviously the fight itself both those personalities colliding Derek Lewis being just so funny it, it, it would be so hilarious but John Jones handling that and countering and stuff but also having to appear not to be too much of a jerk to not get all the likability away from him and everything it would be a hilarious dynamic the stuff they would do Talk about prank wars. Prank wars would be all over that season right there. I would love it so much. And, Kaylin, you're absolutely right. Derek Lewis versus anybody. But for me, especially John Jones, would make one of the best tough seasons ever. It's a great show. I'm, I'm sad I didn't include Derek Lewis. I just <laughs> – I didn't have anywhere to fit him. And I'm like, oh, I guess not. But um, my number one, I can't believe Keelan had this at number four, Jorge Masvidal versus Colby Covington. This is real bad blood here. Like – they were teammates for the longest time, turned enemies. Like, it doesn't write it any better. It's, it's kind of like the TJ versus Kobe, or not Kobe, uh, Cody Garbrandt season, which I feel like it would be that, but even more amplified because it's been brewing over years. It's not, it wasn't just like, a you know, this, ha- this happened last year. This happened a few months ago. No, this bad blood has been brewing forever. And they, Kobe Covington's always talking smack on Jorge Masvidal. Jorge's trying to keep a comp- composure, but also being Jorge and talking smack back. And both these fighters have such good, valuable inputs. Kobe Covington's probably one of the best wrestlers in the uh, welterweight division. And let, uh, maybe better than Kamaru Usman. Who knows? A lot of people think so. A lot of people go back and forth on it. But um, Kobe Covington has some of the best wrestling. Jorge Masvidal is one of the best technical strikers and technical boxers in the welterweight division as well. And just to have them on the Ultimate Fighter, just to see their personalities clash every time they meet each other. Uh, and Kobe Covington's always been known to put up this facade. Would he keep the facade the entire time on the show? Or would he would he let it uh, shine for a little bit when he's coaching his fighters? You know, There's so many different things that could be put into this season. And I would just love to see it more than anything else. I'm pretty sure this season was supposed to happen instead of the Volkanovski-Ortega yeah. season. It, it just fell through. So this season needs to happen here soon. I would pay I would pay pay per view just to see this this season, <laughs> let alone just have be subscribed to ESPN Plus. But right here, Jorge Masvidal versus Colby Covington, number one. Shame on you, Keelan, for having this at number four. <laughs> um, don't give Dan any ideas. You want this to be a subscription? No as well. more money. No more money. <laughs> Dan, you didn't hear that last part. This is why we need the illegal streamers fight because maybe they'll win. True. True. <laughs> you know what? Screw it. I'm back in the illegal streamers. Let's go. Now. We got Habib on our side. We're set. We're good. Yeah. True. He's the finale fighter. You know, yes. it's like the boss battle. Yes. I'm going to smash your boy. Yeah. He'll be Instagram um, live living at the entire time while it's going on. He'll be on, Instagram yeah. living his own yeah. fight. Yeah. Exactly. Um, my number one. I actually think this would be one of the best tough seasons of all time. And it's a fight that should have happened. And it's a fighter we've just mentioned, Tony Ferguson and Khabib. That would be good. Yeah, that would be good. And this just has every single dynamic. It's got the humor of Derek Lewis, who nullifies jiu-jitsu by just standing up. You can't teach (laughs) that, except you can. Um, You know, imagine a season with Tony Ferguson and Habib. How amazing would that be? And in the red corner, you've got the American Kickboxing Academy. You have Javier Mendez. You've got DC. I mean, who wouldn't want to be on that team? But then in the blue corner, you've got one of the most entertaining and great greatest lightweights there's ever been in Tony Ferguson and watching his training sessions would actually be worth subscribing for. (laughs) It's just 
could you imagine like just kicking steel poles and bloody um Flipping German tires, suplexing yeah. boxes and all yeah. this kind of thing? And to- I swear to God, I'd pay for Tony to say this. Guys, it's a rat race, but I'm not a rat. I'm an effing Ninja Turtle. Who's your favorite? Mine's Michelangelo. He would definitely say that before a fight, and his fighters would go out all confused, and they just start Eminari rolling people. It would it would be the tale of two fighters. It would be bizarre. It would be competitive. It would be beautiful. That is my number one. And could you, and we would have actually have got the bloody fight at the end as well. How did it happen? Ah, so, impossible. To, I yeah. know. The only the only way that fight ever happens is in the Matrix somehow. Mm-hmm. Tony Ferguson Habib that would have been my number one dream tough pairing of all time. Yeah, in the Matrix or on the Moon, e- either one of those. Yeah. That's the only place where that <laughs> fight happens. I I see. I would love to put that on the list, but as much as I would love to put that on the list, I can't because of the absolute devastation I would feel when that fight got canceled after the whole season. <laughs> Like I couldn't do it. I, I literally I don't think I could cope with that happening. I, I just as as an MMA fan, as a UFC fan, I would never be able to recover after watching that, girls that, that entire girls season. Don't ever. think if girls don't think men understand pain, we understand pain because <laughs> oh we God. felt it five bloody five times. times. Five times. And and it happening on April first as well. So you have oh. that hope that it's just an April Fool's joke. That is real pain right there. You think it's not real. Then you wake up the next morning and it's absolutely real. You have Ariel Hawani reporting on oh. that is absolute pain right there that is horrible yes we all know that um and then then we saw the 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 the, the lost streak of tony start there oh, after, that, no. after that fight got canceled so many things just happened to crush my soul it so was sad. terrible terrible yeah well okay let's move on from that <laughs> my number <laughs> moment one of silence. <laughs> moment of silence for tony ferguson habib yes my my number one all right so let me expand. Okay, first off, Hunter, you're going to be so mad at me, but I didn't have Colby versus uh, Masvidal on my list. And it's not that I, I wouldn't want to see it, or I don't think it would be one of the best seasons ever. It's just that I think it's too obvious, and I want to go with the too randomness obvious. of my things. You know, I, I think we, I think we all are kind of expecting it. <laughs> we all kind of want it. So I'm going to go with my number one, and this is something that's already been mentioned, but let me just explain myself. So I'm thinking Darren Till, all right? Darren Till versus anybody, just like Derek Lewis. I mean, Darren Till versus anybody, it's going to be entertaining. He's, he's one of the funniest personalities uh, outside of MMA and everything. He, he's, he's amazing. All right, you go Darren Till, Robert Whitaker. I love that so much. You, you, Robert Whitaker, um, their, their fight the first time was actually very, very close. And when you consider what Robert Whitaker has been doing to all of his other opponents, and then you relate that back to Darren Till and you see what Darren Till actually did in that fight. It's actually incredible how close that fight was. And that fight is something that could definitely be made a rematch down the future. Both those Ultimate Fighters things, it would be more lighthearted because both those guys like each other. They're, 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 I would, they're not friends, but they're, 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 it's almost a friendly vibe with each other. It would be competitive, but it would be hilarious and lighthearted. I go to thinking, what could be one more step of that? Have all of those qualities, but also add hatred to that. That would be Mike Perry versus Darren Till right there. And that would be my number one for just one that I would absolutely love to see. Um, I'm not going to say I'm going to pay to see it because I don't want to spend any more subscription <laughs> money on ESPN Plus or anything like that. But I will say this, that would be an amazing Ultimate Fighter season. The pranks that would be going on, just the trash shock and everything. Talk about someone that has a temper. Mike Perry would probably end up trying to break a door, but break his hand or something on the door. That's probably what would happen in that season. Something would happen. He wouldn't be able to control his team. Imagine Mike Perry being the head coach of his own ultimate fight. The one who doesn't even have a coach. That's what yeah. I'm saying. His, his girlfriend's going to be there the entire time. Oh, Lord. Try don't, your best. Don't, 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 even, <laughs> don't, even, don't even mention the raw dog comments coming from Darren Till oh, if she was there too the entire time. Just – absolute madness would be going on in that uh, in that entire season i i seriously think that entire season wouldn't even make it to the finale because everybody would get kicked out on mike perry's game it would implode and and darren till would just keep laughing the entire time i honestly think that would happen that restraining orders would be filed after i I would love to see it i think it would be hilarious and that is my number one You know, it'd be a funny one, Darren Till, Yoel Romero, because you oh, yeah. would not yes. say, "I never yes. want to fight Yoel Romero. That guy's yes. scary." <laughs> nope, you're fighting him next year on oh the Ultimate Fighter too. I would love <laughs> that, that so much. Oh my gosh! Oh, oh man, 
<laughs> oh, that that would just be amazing. And you know, the whole Darren Till Yoel Romero thing. Like <laughs> I remember the morning he posted that when you because he was obviously off his ass drunk the yeah. night before and he started calling out Yoel Romero saying, I'll beat you, I'll beat your ass, and all this <laughs> kind of thing. And it's when you know that uh, picture of the monkey when it's when you wake up and realize you called out Yoel Romero. Yeah. And it's like, ah <laughs> F. That the banter and that would have just been amazing because you'd you'd have just said Yoel screaming, I love you, Darren. And Darren saying, "I don't want to fight you, mate." Oh, that that would just be peak. That would I, I'd have to walk out. It would be that good. You might almost get a, a, like a secondary chill son, and I can't let you get close moment, except for Darren Chill just running away from your. Darren to literally running him. away. Get away from me! <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Honestly, any any Derek Lewis, any Darren Till Ultimate Fire season would just make for just entertainment all the way around. Absolutely. Screw it, Derek Lewis and Darren Till. Why not? Why we'll not at this point? We'll do it. Let's let Darren move up to heavyweight. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what an episode, guys. Phenomenal oh. episode. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Get hyped for the Ultimate Fighter coming soon, June 1st. The new season's getting started. We have our guy in MMA Island represented in the Ultimate Fighter, Dustin Scrappy Lampos. So go ahead and check that out. It's going to be exciting. Um, please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube like usual. We are on iTunes and Spotify and everywhere, literally anywhere you can listen to a podcast, we are there. Please make sure to go ahead and follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island and check out all of our work on our website, MMAIsland.net. Thank you everyone so much for listening. Great, great podcast, guys. Thank you guys. And make sure to tune in again. It's on ESPN plus uh, Tuesday at 6 PM Eastern time. So don't miss it. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Check out the time Hunter just said, cause I'm not in your time zone. I'm not going <laughs> to give you false information, but his is accurate. 6 PM Eastern. I think he said tune yep. in at that time. Ultimate fighter. Let's go.